welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, their creative process and their likes and dislikes. This time I'm talking to Alastair Ben about his work and motivations along with a range of other topics I hope you'll find interesting. Alastair Ben lives and works in a secluded glen on the west coast of Scotland with his wife Anne Kristen. He takes pleasure in sharing his thoughts with others through his ebooks, video series and mentorships. He is a fellow of the Royal Photographic Society, a musician and composer and a writer, and he is mildly obsessed with watching birds. Photography for Alastair is so much more than an end product, and he believes the more we are focused on that, the more elusive it will become. Creativity is hard to pin down. It refuses to be placed under the microscope, and observing it changes it. Our creativity lies in creative living, one of acceptance, non-judgment, and freedom of speech. Our creativity is in there, desperate to keep out, and who does the best job of stopping it? You guessed it, it's us. We discuss his thoughts on creativity and how it relates to self-worth and explore how he has established his business around the ability for people to express themselves through photography, along with a whole lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Alastair. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How's your day going? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, yeah, just back from a 10k run, so feeling energised and nice. not too dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very pleased to uh, have you on the show. Um, it's you know pleasure to have uh, someone of your of your stature, you know, landscape photography. Oh, sorry, photographer of the year 2020, uh, if I if I remember rightly. Yes, uh, apparently so. Um, it, it surprised me as much as it probably surprised everybody else, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was a very pleasant surprise. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> Let, let, let's talk about that a little bit later. What what got you started in photography and landscape photography in particular? I didn't start as a landscape photographer, first of all. I had a, I had a camera when I was a kid, and yes, I used to run around the Scottish landscape enthusiastically pointing at things that I thought looked cool. Um, and then um, I went into a very stressful career. I was in international finance for nearly 20 years flying around the world and living in amazing places and going to lots of amazing places. And um, I think I first bought a digital camera when I was living in Sydney, actually, in 2001, uh, 2001, 2002. I remember buying a little two megapixel Olympus um, point and shoot, really, um, and traveling around and going up to Lamington National Park in Queensland and, you know, down into Royal National Park, south of Sydney and stuff. And just really understanding that when I was looking through the viewfinder, there was a relaxation thing going on. Yeah. So uh, that was the start of photography as an adult. So that's what, 20, 21 years ago, there or thereabouts. Um, And very quickly, um, I was, I was more into birds. I used to do a lot of birding um, and after Australia, we ended up in Southeast Asia again, sort of Malaysia, uh, Kuala Lumpur. Um, and I was doing a ton of birding and uh, looking through a Leica telescope. Um, and this thing called digiscoping started where you could fit a little Nikon cool pics on the top of a telescope and make photographs through that. So that was my first back into photography in a, in a serious way. The digiscoping gravitated through to a longer lens, my first digital SLR. But landscape photography didn't come along until the fall of 2004 um, when I was in Canada visiting some friends in Banff. And uh, good, good place and for I, it to go. Yeah, you know, and it was the first place that was just you're overwhelmed by the landscape. You know, it's Absolutely. just like, holy shit, you know, this place is just. And I was still photographing birds, but obviously there's. I carried on photographing birds until about 2007, um, but the landscapes gradually started to take over. And funnily enough, mostly night photography. That was my main focus at the beginning. Okay. So what what was it about that that sort of grew on you and, and as you say, started to take over? Um. I, well, I, I studied astronomy uh, and astrophysics at uni yeah. back in yeah. back in my dim and distant youth, 
Um, and I've always had a fascination with the night sky. And I think the, the, the concept that you're photographing ancient light really excited me. You know, that you're pointing your camera and the light that's hitting the sensor has been traveling for millions of light years. And, and that kind of, I kind of like that kind of idea. So, and then it was very technical. Uh, there was a lot of technical challenges. There wasn't an awful lot known about night photography from a digital perspective in yeah. the early 2000s. So I'm, I'm a bit of a, back then anyway, it was, I, I really wanted to do something that turned my mind off work and turn my mind off stress yeah. um, and immersing myself in learning and the sort of technical aspect of photography was a real distraction for me, along with like playing guitars and making music and writing and all sorts of other things I've done. Yeah. But the, the landscape photography side of things, I love being outside, whether it's going for a run or a hike or bird watching or just a walk with my wife or whatever. I like being outside um, and I feel at home outside and the photography really became a reason to go outside, I guess, you know, more, more than anything else. And obviously, you know, and I guess we'll get to that, but over the last five or six years, that's really changed. And my focus is very different from perhaps it was 15 to 20 years ago. Yeah. Okay. I still so, like being outside. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. But uh, I guess you've made the lifestyle choice to, you know, quit your full-time job and uh, go full-time with photography. How did you make that decision and what was it? Was it a, a hard one decision or something that you just thought, no, nope, that's it. I'm, I'm done with that high stress work environment and I want to do something different. It wasn't a difficult decision. Um, whether it was a wise decision uh, is questionable. Um, it's, I've always been self-employed. I've been self-employed since I was in my 20s. I, I enjoy that freedom to decide when I'm going to work, how hard I'm going to work. And every dollar you make is a direct result of your efforts. I've always liked that sort of autonomy and independence in the workplace. I make a very bad employee is, is reading between the lines of that. <laughs> I'm like any manager's nightmare. Um, so... I was I was exchanging because I had my own finance company. I had my own business in finance. So I, I carried on with that in a reduced capacity past the point where I'd already started making a living or some some income from from the photography side of things. Right. I think I made the decision in about 2009. I remember quite clearly in about 2009 thinking, right, you know, obviously we'd had the financial crash in 2008. We were in really tough times uh, where so many people were out of work and losing yeah. their jobs and losing their homes. And, and um, I think I, I'd got to the point where I was so stressed, you know, it was such, so much traveling. I mean, I was doing a hundred long haul flights a year wow. plus, plus little flights. So, you know, too many. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I was ill. I, I'd actually made myself quite ill with work. Um, so I think about 2009, I thought, right, I'm going to write a book on night photography. That, that became my focus. So for the next three years, I did tons and tons of research because back in those days, there was, there was like just a couple of rules of thumb on how to photograph at night. Um, so I thought I didn't like rules of thumb very much because they only work when they work. <laughs> you know, they, they, the yeah. rest of the time, they don't work. Yeah. So um, I, in, in I, the right I, conditions, you're fine, but. Yeah, right. yeah, in, in the same conditions as the person made up the rule of thumb, it's perfect. <laughs> you know, but but in, in every other situation, it doesn't. So for about three years, I, I spent a lot of time. I was still living in Tibet at that time. I was living in the Himalaya uh, with lots of clear skies and, and moonlit nights. So it was it was easy to go out and photograph at night. Lived in Spain for a year on the coast, photographing uh, at, at night there too. So 2009 to 2012, I pretty much did nothing but night photography, did all this research, released the book, and it sold really well. It just like right. straight off the bat. Michael Reichman at Luminous Landscape picked it up and did a rave review on it. And just it sold like hotcakes. 
Um, and I thought, well, shit, you know, I, I can make money writing books or, or you know, researching things and, you know, the sort of photography education side of things. So, yeah, I, I, I made the decision fairly easily to, to kind of quit uh, finance. And it wasn't like I was leaving finance to retire. You know, I, I hadn't made so much money that it was like I never have to work again. Quite the opposite, in, in fact. Um, you know, flying around the world at your own expense is expensive, you know, so yeah. you're, you're making money, but you're spending a ton of money yeah, as well. So five miles only go so far. Right, exactly. You know, when you're flying across the Pacific 10 times every three months, it, 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 those air miles disappear pretty quick too. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, um, I I didn't regret that for a second and I never have, you know, it, it it's... It is a lifestyle choice, though, and obviously the the difficulties that arrived with like COVID created a huge problem um, because I was running workshops 25 weeks a year, 25, 26 weeks a year. So yeah. when COVID came along, they all disappeared and all of a sudden I became like a YouTube guy um, because that was the only way to make a living was, yeah. was to, to do it that way. So, you know. Listen, anything that's worth doing is going to be hard work. And yep. you know, if you want to if you want to make money in landscape photography, it's going to be hard work. Yep. There are very few Peter Licks in this world, um, thankfully. <laughs> but but um, you know, it's yeah, not not a difficult choice. I'm a lot healthier and a lot happier for 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 the choice. Yep. Um, I don't make anywhere near as much money as I used to do, but I'm significantly happier and will probably live longer. And, and that means a lot to me, really. Absolutely. Yeah. So what would you suggest to people that are thinking about that? You know, they're in whatever the, their, their situation is. Obviously, you know, that, that'll vary a little bit financially. But what are the things that people need to think about if they are really con seriously considering becoming a, a full-time landscape photographer in particular? Uh, I get this question quite a lot um, because it's a very popular wish. It's a very popular dream for people to spend their lives um, theoretically out in the landscape all the time making photographs. Um, unfortunately, that is not the reality of being a professional photographer. Yeah. Um, not everyone who makes their living full time can authentically call themselves a professional photographer yeah. um, because being a professional anything requires a significant amount of effort. It requires a significant amount of time and dedication to your craft and yeah. not, just, not just having a camera in your hand and knowing what button to press when or what menu function to go into. That's not being a professional photographer. A professional photographer is someone who is adding value to our art form, who, yeah. is, who is innovating rather than just replicating. Yeah. Um, so one of the first questions I really asked myself when I was thinking about it, because I'm quite an analytical guy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm I'm impetuous and emotional, but equally I can be super, super focused and, and kind of very, very analytical and very objective about things. Um, and one of the first things I ever asked myself was, can you make a difference? What can you add to what's already out there? Being peddled by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Yep. And um, I'd, I'd like to think I have added something um, either through my education material or the way I run workshops or the way I write or the way I speak in public or the way I give presentations or um, you know, obviously the, the recent fellowship uh, with the Royal Society. Th those types of things are little check boxes. Yeah, yeah. So I think being... Uh, this is a contentious issue. You know, the, there's there's no... There's no easy way to have this conversation without coming across as a judgmental idiot, you know. So I'm, but I'm prepared to throw myself to the lions uh, sure. at, at the moment because, because it's true, you know. And if, if people want to call me out on it, that's fine. But there are, I know personally, many, many people who aspire to be professional landscape photographers 
who will not make it as a professional yeah. landscape photographer or as a full-time landscape photographer. And they are sacrificing finance and health and family for that. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, is a very, very dangerous road to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what happened with social media was that popular people had a path into full-time landscape photography because they already had an audience. Yeah, yeah. Regardless of whether they were amazing photographers or not. I mean, you can have a million subscribers on Insta and be a good photographer, but you make your living as a dentist or an accountant or you drive trucks for a living or whatever. You know, you you can have that following. And sure, you can make money through merchandise or you know, writing books on composition or whatever it may be. So, you know, it, it is possible if, if you just want to, you know, if you've got nothing new to add, you can you can just copy and paste out of other people's material and create products and sell it. You know, there's nothing to stop people doing that. And there are people who do that. Yeah. Um, I would... The, the, the whole landscape world has changed in the 20 years that I've been involved in it. When I started, it was really easy. You know, you, you could, I used to get magazines writing to me, asking to use images and offering me money. Yep. You know, that, that's ancient history. You know, when I, when I started selling stock f- photography back in the sort of mid 2000s, it was easy. You know, you were making a couple of thousand dollars a month just Absolutely. by having, a, by having images online. Yep. that's that's ancient history now there are way more people out there making photographs at a very high standard now than there were 20 years ago um i would say my contemporary photography is more introspective and personal than commercial mm. um these days it, it it's more about what it's doing for me than what it's going to do in terms of making money from stock or that type of thing mm-hmm. Anyone who wants to do it, if they really want to do it, can do it. I, I think that's an important thing to say. Um, but the reality is, during COVID, I was spending 90% of my life in this office um, and very, very little of it out making photographs. There was six-month periods last year where I didn't have a camera in my hand. Yeah. And so being a professional photographer does not mean being out in the field all the time when I was running 25, 26, 27 weeks of workshops every year, sure, you spend tons of time in the field and you get to go to beautiful places and help people. And, you know, it's a very rewarding thing. Um, And you do get to to make photographs an awful lot more often, or at least be in the landscape a lot more often. Um, But again, you know, photography for me now is that I don't want to be in the landscape 26, 27 weeks of the year making photographs. I want to be in the landscape 52 weeks of the year to be in the landscape and occasionally make photographs, <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a different desire from my own point of view. So, yeah, to, to summarize, I would say that I would probably dissuade people from taking that step. Uh, unless they're either very financially secure and they don't need the money. Yep. In which case there's a moral issue, which is by them making 50,000 a year doing something as a hobby, are they taking $50,000 a year out of somebody that's got two kids and a mortgage to pay? Yep. Uh, So I I think there's a moral issue there in in terms of if someone doesn't need the money, then they're taking the money out of someone's pocket who does need the money. And and I, I, I I think that's a very serious responsibility um i think there's a social responsibility to that um so i I think it's a big it's a big question um and yeah we we could go down the rabbit hole with that one (laughs) i'll I'll, I'll take it a little bit further down the rabbit hole i guess one one of the things uh that you said before is that you know there's there's many more good landscape photographers out there I'm interested in your view as to why you think that is. Is it just the proliferation of social media and easy availability of, uh, you know, the the equipment and the and the I guess the evolution that digital photography in particular has gone through, or do you think it's more just 
there's it, it's easier for, for for people now because of some of those tools because photoshop now is so powerful you know way more powerful than it was back in you know uh 2008 9 even you know what what do you think is driving some of that uh you know increase in the numbers of people that are interested in it when before digital when you had to learn your craft with film it was a very expensive apprenticeship yeah you know, shooting 360 frames on a day was unheard of yeah yeah no and no nobody could do it unless no one could, they... afford, no one could afford to do it yeah. it was as simple as that unless you were getting your film for free from an agency who were paying you to shoot you couldn't do it you know nobody could afford that or very few people could afford it plus the the amount of trial and error the amount of dedication to record your exposure settings and to just work through that whole process of mastering in in i know we're, we're not using the videos but i'm doing the, the quote fingers um you know mastering the the tool the medium yep. it was just it was a, there was a very high price of entry for that now obviously there's people banging around with 10 grand's worth of uh, digital camera gear in their in their camera bags so there's a certain price point associated with that but you don't need 10 grand's worth of camera gear to make decent digital photographs these days a couple of grand will, will get you there um so i think the the price of entry is a lot lower these days secondly the amount of learning material that's out there is exponentially increased you know we've got youtube channels where you can search anything for free absolutely anything i mean i i don't i don't even know how many videos i've got on my main youtube channel for free you know yeah. so forget about the paid stuff you could probably do a pretty decent course on making yourself a reasonable landscape photographer for free plus all my mates who who, who do similar things so I think there's a, a combination of just an, an easier tool to learn. Um, you can go out and shoot 360 frames, 3,600 frames, and learn from every single one of them. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the learning is probably easier. Um, and there's, there's just a, so much more learning material available. And I think there's just, there's just an awful lot more inspiration around as well you know there, there's so many people now i mean instagram didn't exist when i started facebook barely existed when i started actually um you know and there was the kind of the forum thing and and that was kind of reasonable earlier on sort of 2003 2004 so i think there's just more of everything available there's more information about where to go and shoot what time to go to certain locations the you know the 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 tide that's going to be at a certain location on a certain day in a certain so, month like photo pills etc cetera, etc cetera. google yeah it. right there's, there's just more assets out there mm. you know to go from the people who just want to go and replicate other people's photographs right through to people who want to plan to be in a certain place at a certain time to do a certain thing under certain conditions there's just more data available um so yeah, I think a combination of tech plus the availability of learning material and other assets has accelerated that uh, proliferation of of people, yeah. and also more more kind of mentors out there. You know, more more people to kind of look up to and think, well, they're you know they look kind of like me, and they're the kind of age that I am, and you know they live in this sort of location, and they're going out and doing this, and it, it seems to me. I only have to apply myself and therefore I can do it. Uh, so it, it seems a lot more accessible, I think. Whereas my peer or my my inspirations when I was starting out in the early 2000s, you know, people like Galen Rowell or whatever, yeah. who was an, an, an early, a very early um, inspiration for me, you know, just what he was doing just seemed remarkable. You know, it, it's... Yeah. Yeah. it didn't seem to fit where I was at the time or but that's one of the reasons I moved to Tibet you know was to be in the big mountains in that kind of landscape that Galen had had photographed so much so it there was there, there was a there was a definite tide that I was getting swept along by uh, as well um so yeah I I think that 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 would be my answer to that but yeah. at the same time everyone's 
everyone's different. <laughs> you know, yeah. so. And that's the thing, everyone takes it up from a different perspective as well. You know, there's uh, there's people out there that are, you know, they, they start strictly on landscapes or strictly on astro or strictly on street photography, for example, or seascapes. And that's they just concentrate on that genre and uh, you know grow grow their skills and portfolios around that that specific you know uh, the thing I I noticed about Insta as it as it grew was the number of people that were I guess um, what's the right word cultivating a particular look to their grid you know I think and. and the, the proliferation of people doing that sort of grew that trend to specialise and, and be, you know, good in that particular area of the craft rather than being a, a, a really good generalist, you know? Yeah, and, and I, th I think just to, to, to kind of highlight that point again, that being a good photographer does not guarantee being a good, successful business person. Absolutely. You know, this is an absolute... I see it so many times. There's people I know who are incredible photographers who really struggle to make a living because they don't like to talk about their work. They don't like to self-promote. They, they don't have very good business skills. They, they hate to write. They can't do their accounts properly. They can't build websites. They don't know what they want to do. You know, they, all they want to do is be out in the landscape making photographs. And you can be the best photographer in the world. But unless you've got a certain amount of business savvy, you're going to fail. Yeah. Yeah. There are more successful photographers who are great business people than amazing photographers. Yeah. There's more there's more mediocre photographers who are great business people than there are amazing photographers who are mediocre right. business people. You know, <laughs> and you, you have to be a video editor, you have to be a graphic designer you have to be able to write fluidly you need you, know, you need you need to be able to string a sentence together yep. you know there's a lot of skills that are necessary and I guess I'm kind of lucky as I've got a skill set that kind of slots me in mm. so that there's a certain argument that whatever I do I'll be reasonably successful at it just because I apply myself and I have a certain skill set that yep. allows me to do that and I have a wife who's a great video editor, so you know that 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 helps massively. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to train my wife how to how to edit videos. <laughs> yeah, you need a taser. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I won't tell her that. <laughs> so edit, we could edit that bit out. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I, I guess talk us through the education process i guess you you went through you know you mentioned um you know uh, the the inspiration that came from uh galen's work you know was was it as simple as just following along and you know reading books and you know self-educating or did you take a more formal approach to it um i never i never did any formal training so i'm just turning off my iphone um I, I never did any formal training so i didn't go on any courses or or uh, pay anybody to teach me anything so yeah i'm the sort of classic self-taught person yep. um, the the irony of all of this is that when i was 14 15 years old running around the scottish highlands pointing my camera at stuff that i thought cool was cool and just interested me and i found engaging ironically is probably closer to what I do now than what I did for 15 years after formally studying right. uh, or, or, or being very focused on studying. I, I, I went down the rabbit hole as, as a student, um, buying lots of books and reading uh, an awful lot about, you know, well, basically, when I, when I started making landscape photographs, I did so intuitively. I didn't know anything. Like, it was, I remember buying my first... 1740 or something lens yep. and in Canada and the guy in the shop said oh you need some filters for that you know and it's like what are filters I mean I literally knew nothing I didn't know about grads or polarizers or anything like that so everything was kind of intuitive and I made aesthetics that I liked you know that that's kind of where I went with that and I, I understood how time would change 
the look of photographs. Yeah. But it was very, I, I kind of look back on it now and, and think that I studied very, very hard and, and read a lot of books, but I don't think I thought very much. You know, I, I, I don't think I actually took any of this information in and thought about it. I just replicated, you know, it was just like, the, you know, like classically reading a, a, cam, a photography magazine and it's like, okay, 10 stop ND filters, this is what you do with it. And I would just go out and do it without thinking about why or right. whether whether a 30 second exposure was more appropriate than a, a 14 second exposure. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, there was no there wasn't kind of an aesthetic rationale going on. Uh, so I, I, I was, I was very, it wasn't, I mean? targeted. it wasn't targeted. No, no, it, it was just, it was just really, I, I studied, but more for the sake of studying and getting all this information, thinking that that was the answer. So I became quite a technical photographer, particularly as we got into the sort of 2007, 8, 9, 10 period when HDR became a thing, mm -hmm. uh, exposure blending became a thing, and luminos luminosity masks became a thing. Uh, I was right. I was a very early adapter of that with friends of mine like Sean Bagshaw and Tony Kuiper. Yep. Um, so I, I knew those guys from like 2010, so really quite a long time ago. Um, so I was kind of technical, and obviously Mark Adamus is a really good friend of mine. So where he was going and people like Ted Gore and Alex Noriega and you know there was that kind of big landscape vibe going on where it was just this everything was bigger and better and wilder so yeah. I kind of got hooked into that um, and I got to a point I remember vividly Mark and I led a, an expedition together into Tibet um, in the fall of 2015 so Mark Adamus and I we, we, we took a bunch of clients around into the the east side of Everest in Tibet, into a place called the the, the Karta Valley. Um, and working with Mark for two weeks, three weeks, told me that that was not the type of photographer I wanted to be because the guy's energy is just insane. I mean, he's yeah. just, he's a machine and a brilliant photographer and a brilliant processor. Um, and I just, I realized there and then that that's not who I wanted to be. And at the end of that period, I went into quite a, a period of self-reflection where I was making photographs that were aesthetically very pleasing and very popular. You know, 500px was on on the go by the time 1x.com had started. Yeah. You know, there was there was an area of places where popularity and popularity really became the driver. It was yeah. the community builder, and I had aspirations of running my own workshop company, and you know you needed clients so being a popular photographer was the way to get clients so it was really yeah. visibility and everything yeah it wasn't rocket science you know it was more people like your work the easier it is to sell a workshop it was not a difficult uh, equation to deal with but i did get to the end of 2016 being knowing that i could go anywhere in any light in any circumstances with any focal length and make decent photographs you know photographs that most people would go yeah that's a really good photograph yeah, you know, but I, I still didn't know why I was making photographs, you know, and and then I, I don't know if this is part of your question uh, direction, of course, the time I went into the Gobi and that whole change from the, the January of 2017 until now yeah. changed everything, you know, and I'm, I'm not the same guy sat talking to you today as I was in January 2017. Yeah. I'm poles apart from that guy. So that's this perfect segue into the second half of the of the talk, really, I guess. Yeah. So what what was it that changed? What it, was it introspection or was it something external that you know somebody said or somebody did? No, it was mostly introspection. Uh, I, I was very depressed. I, I, I'd, I'd suffered from uh, depression and anxiety for most of my adult life. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've told this story often in public, so this isn't causing me any grief to, to, to open up like this. Good. Um, my, my dad died when I was about 18 or 19, and I, I, I very quickly started having anxiety attacks. 
uh, and lived with it for most of my adult life. Totally functional, you know, I, I could go into meetings and, and function and I could work and, you know, but inside was pretty awful. You know, it was a horrible place to live inside my head. So by December 2016, I had this sort of photography was sort of unknown to me. It was therapy. There was a certain amount of therapy going on. But because of the output and my focus on output, it was very different from who I was. So I was making output that was a facade or a veneer. It wasn't an accurate reflection of who I actually was or who I am. And around about the same time, I mean, I'd been living in Tibet for seven years and, you know, Buddhism kind of rubs off on you. You know, I'm not a Buddhist, but I meditate and I understand the, the benefits of meditation. Sure. Um, so I, that, that's something I've been doing for a few years. And every time I meditated, I realized that the person who was on the outside was very different from the guy on the inside. And that kind of conflict was the cause of an awful lot of my grief. So anyway, January of 2017, I went off to Western China uh, with my then wife. Uh, we were, we're now divorced uh, and I'm remarried, actually, um, very happily so, in fact. Um, and we went off to Western China for about a month um, and ended up in the Gobi Desert uh, camping at like minus 26 Celsius and yep. hundreds of miles from the nearest road. And, you know, in this landscape, of just sand you know the 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 dunes are about they're nearly 700 meters tall you know so they're really lacking dunes and you're just in them for days on end and um as a kind of a 14 24 wide angle uh, dramatic landscape photographer type of guy it was hell you know it was it was a very unforgiving landscape what what, what are you (laughs) yeah you know it 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 was really, it, it, everything just felt contrived yeah. trying to go about it that way. So I stuck a long lens on an 80 to 400 and just thought, right, I'm not going to think about photography. I'm not going to think about composition. I'm not going to think about what I should be pointing my camera. At. I'm just going to allow the landscape to tell me where to point my camera. So if I saw a nice line with some nice contrast or some nice light or some textures or whatever. So every time I saw something that I thought, that's cool. I'd point my camera at it, mostly handheld, unless it was lower light. And then I'd do a bit of focus stacking, you know, with layers and because you get a lot of compression with a long lens. Yeah. So there was still a little bit of technique kind of bubbling under the surface, but it was mainly handheld work. Mm. So that started in 2017, I was in the Gobi three times. And then over the next three years I was in the Gobi another four times so seven trips into the Gobi between um, January 17 to February 19. Okay Um, so sorry what 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 was it that kept drawing you back? Well we we, we, all the photographs uh, were were very popular ironically Uh, so (laughs) Um, that I was running a full-on photography business by that point in time and running workshops. So my ex-wife and I were running workshops into the Gobi because people wanted to go. (laughs) So we had, we had a queue of people just wanting to go. So we just did back to back trips into the Gobi, um, you know, with these full-on camping adventures, you know, which was really insane. So, um, what happened was when I got back from the Gobi, I really felt like I had something of an epiphany. Um, where my the, the approach to photography had been a very intuitive thing. It hadn't been a conscious thing. So I wasn't consciously composing. I was in, intuitively composing. Yeah. And what they do is they create very different things. If, if you consciously go into the landscape, you will only make the photographs that you can imagine. If you unconsciously photograph, you can make photographs that surprise you. Yeah, and it was it was like a it was like a a fork in a path where all of a sudden it was like okay well that's the way that everybody else is doing it I like it this way and I very much took a swing. So over the next year, I I I really the more I looked at the photographs and the more I processed them intuitively, what I realized was that there were five qualities that photographs or scenes have Mm -hmm. that basically 
create what I call an emotional fingerprint for either the landscape or the photograph. So they're luminosity, contrast, color, atmosphere, and geometry, the yep. five triggers. Basically, every dollar I have in my bank account is because of those five words <laughs> over the last two and a half to three years. So I've been writing books about these qualities. So I started with a book called Luminosity and Contrast, yep. which is basically a book just about the qualities of luminosity and contrast and transitions um, texture, detail, things like that. And then I wrote a book called The Color of Meaning, which is adding color into the mix. Mm -hmm. um, and then successive products that I've been bringing out over the last year are looking more into the, the mental health benefits of photographing in this manner, yep. um, being accepting of conditions that are present rather than what you wish were there. Mm -hmm. um, so managing our expectations um, and the introspective nature of photography and how it can be a catalyst. And this is why in the summer of this year, I'm releasing the book, finally, uh, Out of Darkness, it's called. Um, it's nearly ready to go to the printers in Italy. Um, and this book documents in about 160, 170 pages this journey from being that type of photographer and person who was suffering incredibly from anxiety and panic attacks and depression to this guy now who doesn't. Um, and I mean, I've gone from like full on medicated for anxiety and depression to someone now who I haven't been medicated in what, three years or something like that. And that is because of this change that's taken place so i think that's pretty profound for me at least anyway so i wanted to produce a book about that so that that's been but it's taken me over two years two to three years to actually get the book to this point in time and i've got some really cool people writing for it there's joe cornish and william neal have written uh forwards for it um mm -hmm. so yeah that that was a long answer to, to, to your oh, question it, it, <laughs> and that's the nice thing about these sort this form of uh discussion is that it doesn't matter how long the answer is we can uh right yeah, if, if you're you're happy to talk about it i'm happy to listen <laughs> i'm always happy to talk about photography <laughs> and, and mental health you know these, these yeah, are the absolutely things. and it, it's a it's a big ticket item for me as well making sure that you know people are getting their heads straight about why they're doing things and that that's why in in terms of this particular podcast, I'm trying to concentrate on the motivations, the inspirations, rather than the technical aspects. Yeah, you know? right. Technical aspects you can pick up. That that's a, that's the skill. The motivation, the um, inspiration, is I think a lot harder to get your head around, and has a lot to do with whether or not you're thinking um, healthily about your photography or not. And for me, you know, that, that motive, you know, you've got, to, you've got to get to the root of why you're doing it. And, right. you know, if people don't do that, then they are going to find themselves in, you know, mental spirals that, you know, are unhelpful or unhealthy. And, you know, it, it's one of the things I've talked with a number of uh, other people on the podcast in the past about in terms of, you know, their relationship with social media, their relationship with, you know, how they, you know, see the world in terms of, you know, whether, whether it's for the likes and, you know, that, that sort of thing or whether it's actually for, for their own, you know, uh, satisfaction, you know, and if it's popular, great. If it's not, they're, they're still okay with it. Yeah, and I think this is the and this is the great dichotomy is that you know if we make photographs to be popular, then the tendency is for us to continue wanting to be popular, and Absolutely. we continue we and you become continually reliant upon external validation for your dopamine hit, mm -hmm. and. The, you know, it's like I could post six photographs in a row. I mean, I don't really post very much to Insta anymore. I've, I've, I've kind of, you know, 
I've got over 39,000 people that follow me on Insta, but it's a they punish you when you don't post. You know, they yeah. stop sharing your work when you don't post. And and I'm sorry, I just don't want to be a slave to an algorithm, you know. Yeah, and yeah, to me, the the way Insta in particular, you know, the way that the the algorithm now favors video over stills for yeah. etc. You know, for 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 many photographers, their engagement is dropping, and they're they you know I, I think they're they're starting to you know jump ship. I know a woman who had half a million followers on her Facebook page. Yep. a few years ago back in like 2008 something like that she had half a million people mm. so every time she posted something it was like you know 30,000 40,000 likes yep. hundreds and hundreds of comments and then Facebook had the great idea of starting to charge you for engagement and yep. they were asking her tens of thousands of dollars a month to yep. reach 40 percent of her audience yeah you know I'm just I'm not going to be somebody else's monkey <laughs> it's as simple as that and I think this going back to your question about you know being a professional photographer the the, the difficulty exists where popularity equates the dollars yep it's as simple as that you know if, if no one knows who you are or or your work doesn't get in front of enough eyeballs it doesn't matter how good it is you know and it will not grow organically no, that's, exactly that's right. a fact. You, I, I remember when a really good friend of mine, Theo Bosboom, brilliant, brilliant Dutch photographer. I mean, international award-winning photographer. He, he cleans up and all of these big international awards, meaningful international awards. Um, and he joined 500px and his work was ignored. Yeah. You know, because it, it was an high-impact engagement um, candy. Yeah. You know, so, you know, he was ignored. People have put Ansel Adams' work on social media and it gets ignored. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, because it's not impactful in that yeah. way. So, yeah, I mean, I, I it, it is a constant stress. If, you know, if you need to make a certain number of dollars on a monthly basis to pay your living expenses or you've got a kid in school or a mortgage or all those types, if you have monthly expenditure that you have to make, and you're not hitting your engagement targets and those eyeballs are not getting converted into dollars, you're fucked. Yep. Yep. End of story. Doesn't matter how good a photographer you are, mm. you can be award winning, multi award winning, incredibly educated and insightful photographer. If yep. you're not hitting those targets, you're in stress city and that is not a good place to be. Yep. And I've ended up creating a niche for myself. I just invented a category of photography, this expressive photography, which, you know, summarizes exactly why I make photographs and I just do exactly what I want. And I've built an audience who it resonates with, uh, but it's only going to be a matter of time until other people start doing that and talking about it, people with bigger audiences that, than I do. Yeah. And they, they attract more eyeballs. So, you know, it, it's a constant thing. So yeah, anyone who thinks that this is an easy career, it's not. <laughs> it's just not. Think again. Yeah. So in terms of uh, your expressive photography sort of business, um, if if I can call it that, um, you know, your YouTube channel is is a part of that, which obviously you know sort of stemmed a little bit from uh, the the COVID situation and not being able to do workshops. Um, you know, it, it, it's looking, I guess, to educate, um, discuss various aspects of creativity and photography with uh, people. What is it that you're actually trying to achieve with that, not just the YouTube channel, but that whole expressive photography um, thing, aside from obviously making some money, you know, that's at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, I mean, you know, make, making money, like we said, is a very, very important thing. I mean, you know, there's no point in being in business if you're not going to make any money. I mean, it's, no, it's just, it's, it, it's every, every business is in, in it to make money. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and anyone who says or not has too much money. <laughs> it's That's as simple as that. They don't need the money. Um, so expressive photography for me is, uh, 
it's the reason I get out of bed in the morning, really. Um, you know, I, I'm very aware of how profoundly happier I am as a photographer now than I was six or seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and not just a photographer, I'm just happier as a person. Now, that's an important change in life. I think if people were brutally honest with themselves, most people would say that there are things in their life they would change. Yep. Uh, whether it's their health or something about their relationship or the job they do or the house they live in or the suburb that they live in or the country they live in uh, or some other attributes of their self that, you know, they're not very self-confident or they, um, they don't feel worthy or they're not very popular. or You know, there's lots and lots of things that we could say, I'd like to change that. Um, and for me, I think if you are not reliant on your photography to make a living, then why choose to practice photography as if your life depended on it? Yeah. And I think I see this more often than people would care to think. Everybody's out there pushing their product, pushing, you know, everybody it's like your name photography website you know I've got every, one. <laughs> yeah most people do most yeah. people do and most of these people have day jobs and that's great you know it's it's there are massive advantages to doing that you know being out in the countryside immersing yourself in the landscape looking through a viewfinder which shuts off all the shit that's going on in the world right now. You know, yeah. there's no shortage of shit for us to worry about. Yeah. Climate change, war, you know, famine, financial crisis, interest rates, inflation, gas prices, utility prices. The world's fucked, as we well know. So when you look through a, a viewfinder, you get a couple of seconds of respite from that. Yeah. That, that is good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So if photography can be this utopian, perfect thing, you don't need the money. You've got free time. You've got enough money and free time to go out in the landscape and enjoy yourself rather than getting shot at when you're going to go and get water. Yep. You know, those things are, you don't have the time to worry about your creativity. You're keeping your head down. Yep. Yeah. So if you're not getting shot at and you've got a full belly and you've got a roof over your head, and you've got enough money to get you to the end of the month and maybe beyond the end of the month. And you can buy a nice camera and travel to places to go to beautiful locations with people to, that, that can help you and inspire you. And you can mix with like-minded people and have a great time and talk about creativity. That is a luxury. Yeah. Yeah. You're already in the top 5% of the world because you have a luxury to do that. Absolutely. So why, why on earth would you want throw yourself into the 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 ground beef grinder of competitive landscape photography to get more eyeballs on your work to get more popularity to get more likes on instagram to to compromise your creativity to fit into the box that's going to be more popular yeah yeah that i don't understand yeah because if i if i had if 10 million dollars dropped into my bank account overnight there are many things in my life, my business life that I would change. Yeah. yeah. I would keep the forum that I run. I have a private expressive photographers forum yep. that I would keep because that that's like inspiration for me. I mean, it's like this community of people who are just so open and accepting and non-judgmental and posting the weirdest photographs and talking about why they love them. That, that is amazing. It's the, it's the antithesis of, of Instagram, <laughs> really. <laughs> so <clears throat> expressive photography for me is saying to people, if you don't have to do this, why do you do it? Mm. You know, how, you know, people talk about creativity as being the most elusive thing in the world when it's the easiest thing in the world, as long as you don't try to be somebody else. Sure. You know, if, if I was to look through your portfolio and thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, try to photograph like like you i might be i might be trying to do something that is so 
opposite from my intuition and the things that I would point my camera at. But if you focus on that so much, you might get quite good at doing it, but all you're doing is getting really good at not being you. Exactly. Whereas expressive photography for me is how can you be more like you? Mm. Yeah. So I've always joked and said, you know, I'm done with competitiveness because I'm the best in the world at being Alistair Ben. You know, that that I'm the best in the world at being me. <laughs> yeah. So I that's what my life is about, is I try to be the best version of myself in a quite a forgiving, quite accepting way. I'm what 175 centimeters tall. So I'm never, you know, my wife's taller than I am, you know, but I'm I don't worry about that anymore. I'm yeah. losing all my hair. I don't worry about that anymore. You know, I've got a big nose. I'm not worried about that anymore. Yeah, I was not worried about those things a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I just want to be fit and healthy. And I want to make photographs that reflect, reflect my preference. Just the same as when I grab a guitar off the wall, I play music that fits my preference. I don't have an audience of fans to please with my guitar playing. I've got a studio in here. There's computers, there's keyboards. There's all sorts of stuff I can do to make music that I like. My wife doesn't even like my music. Yeah, but I do. So this is my space. You know, there's a there's a door over there that I can close and I can put a set of headphones on and make music that pleases me. And yeah. more importantly, expresses things inside of me that need to get out. Yeah. yeah. And that's if we bottle up and we contain and we just lock away, that's not addressing anything. That's not overcoming or growing or learning from these things mm. sometimes I, I still feel sad sometimes or even melancholic but i can go out with a camera or pick up a guitar and make music that releases melancholy that expresses melancholy yep. and somehow that that externalization is freedom you know, because it's you can see it, you can hear it from an outside perspective. And I, I'll play things sometimes. It's just so surprising to hear. And just the same as I'll go and make photographs that are surprising. And they might not be very accessible and they might not be very pretty, but they helped me in that time. They, they, they somehow expressed who I was in that moment or they expressed who I am in a moment when I'm sat in front of the computer. And that resonance with, with the data is a very liberating thing because I'm not I'm not going out trying to make templated photographs of the landscape that will get me two thousand likes on Instagram. And the irony is, is that the photographs I do now post on social media, which tend to be quite introspective, have have a growing audience because people are tired with the popularity rat race. Yep. People are tired with seeing the same shot again and again and again and again. And the irony these days is people are turned on by individuality. Yeah. So that's really what expressive photography is to me, is, is not to try and make 100,000 Alistair Ben clones, but how to make 100,000 individuals who express their creativity in entirely different ways that subsequently goes on to helping them to be better and help them feel better about being then. Fantastic. You know, that, that, that seems to me a far more worthwhile thing than helping someone win a local camera club competition by being very formulaic about their approach to photography. Totally, totally. Yeah. So, well, now, well, of course, this comes at a price. <laughs> you know, and, and that price is you have to go down the rabbit hole and decide who you are. Um, exactly, I think, I've said recently, landscape photography is an excellent way of expressing yourself, but you need to have a self to express. And that that is the hard part. Absolutely, yeah. So what parallels do you see or have you found between your music and your creativity in, in photography? I'm just starting to really explore that from a creative point of view. Um, for many years, I have played guitar since I was like 14, I guess. So what's that, 41 years now. Um, but I always had aspirations to play a certain style of music. Most of the music I like is quite technical. It's quite, quite complicated music. Sure. Um, I, was really, I was really into prog, particularly. I mean, 
Pink yeah. Floyd t-shirt. I think should Floyd, be a bit of a clue. <laughs> but you know, bands, you know, bands that are quite most of the bands I liked when I was a kid and, and as a, an adult were very proficient with their instrument. And what that does is it puts a very, there's a very steep learning curve. There's a very long learning curve to become proficient at an instrument at that level. And um, it takes a lot of time. So I, I reached a stage now where I have enough technical proficiency to express myself on a guitar. Uh, play keyboards and I can program and stuff like that. So I've, I've got enough technical proficiency now to make aesthetics that I like. Um, I totally believe that the the rule, well, I'm not going to use the word rules, that the path to being a creative musician are exactly the same as the path to being a creative photographer. Mm -hmm taking a Pink Floyd t-shirt as an example, I could grab a guitar off the wall and play another brick in the wall or comfortably numb or something like that. Yeah. And it might sound great, but I didn't write it. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't create that. I'm performing that. And, you know, if I change a few notes or, or play the notes in a slightly different way so that yeah. they articulate into, a, into a jazz jazz funk arrangement or something. Yeah, like that. you know, well that that's trending into creativity because you're yeah. you're you're not just replicating, you're you're using it as a foundation point, or even the scale that something is in. If it's in D minor yep. Lydian or you know, or D Lydian or or something like that, then you know, you can change things up that way. But I mean, some some of my students over the years have been amazing musicians, and we use musical language all the time. I'll even talk about things like volume mm -hmm. when I'm talking about photography. You're yep. looking at an image and thinking about, well, it's very loud. You know, yeah. contrast, saturation, clarity, all of those things are very synonymous with volume. You yep. crank up the clarity of a photograph, it gets louder. You yeah. crank up the saturation, it gets louder. You know, you you reduce contrast, it gets quieter. It gets less impactful. So, I, yeah, I, I use musical analogies. Well, even even yeah. the compositions, uh, you know, you can you can actually have a quite quite a busy, you know, street composition, for example, versus a very minimalist seascape with a you know a, a ten stop ND filter yeah. on. So everything is just parallel lines with maybe a bump or two here. The, the, yeah, the, the, the compositional thing's interesting. Um, I, I've thought a lot about this. Um, and when you compose music, you start with a blank page. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you compose in the field, you start with something. Yeah, luminous, contrast, color, atmosphere, yeah. geometry. You, you're, you're starting with something that already has its own feel to a certain mm. extent. That's how I see the landscape anyway. So there is a, dif a difference in composing musically versus composing, yeah. um, you know, but there, there are certainly numerous, but I think the same goes for dance or creative writing or um, any of the other performing arts, painting, uh, sculpting, pottery, all of these things, creativity, creativity is, the the most interesting thing in the world to me the the pursuit of creativity or the lack of pursuit of creativity the release of creativity is is really it's huge for me it, it's really my you know I, i'm my work is not done on this subject <laughs> good to hear good to hear <laughs> um i guess you know you do you see that as being a significant contribution? The the um, uh, the, the the work that you're doing on expressive photography. Do you see that as contributing significantly to adding to the art, as you said at the beginning, or is or uh, all trying to restrict that mainly to the you know photographs you're taking? I that is important to me. Uh, to be honest, um, and not from an egotistical point of view, you know, I, I, I've really, it's very easy when people hear me talk or speak to me in person to think that my confidence is somehow ego driven. You know, I, I can talk confidently about this because I've been thinking about it for over 20 years. 
you know, I, I've, I've, I've thought about these things to an extremely deep level mm. for over 20 years. So I should be able to talk confidently about it. You know, you should be able to ask me anything and I should be able to give you an answer without saying, oh, well, wait, you know, let, let's take a time out type of thing. Um, but it's not driven by ego. It's not because I want to be the most famous photographer ever or the most popular photographer ever or people to even think Alistair's a great photographer. It doesn't really mean that much to me because at three o'clock in the morning when I'm lying in bed and I wake up, I want to be at peace with myself. You know, I, I don't want to be thinking I've got this to 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 live up to or I've got um, my, my engagement is down by 4%. What am I going to do about it? Yeah. I don't want I don't want my creativity to be, to be driven by my ego. Um, so my my desire to, to add something to the art form is very much because I think I have something to add. Um, and two, two things have happened really um, in the last two to three years that that are somehow, uh, affirming to me that I'm on the right path with some of this. The first is the growth of expressive photography as a company where we have an awful lot of clients. We sell an awful lot of books and an awful lot of videos. Um, the YouTube channel is at the whim of YouTube to a certain extent. The algorithm is still the algorithm. And if you don't make clickbait titles and clickbait thumbnails and all of that type of thing, then of course that suffers. But there's over 25,000 people now who subscribe to the YouTube channel, which isn't huge. You know, there, there are people running into walls who have more subscribers than, than I do, you know, just for, so that's fine. But there's the, the forum, the community that I have has enough people in it now that tell me that there's a need for this, that, that the people who, who learn it and engage with it change. I have, people who I've been working with for a couple of years now who are different people because of this, like people who've come out of huge depressions, you know, almost to the point of being suicidal, mm -hmm. who are now functioning humans with self-respect and self-esteem and self-validation and self-actualization. And that, that's how many likes on Insta is that worth? Yeah. You know, so that that's really important to me. And if, if I can change one life by them taking their foot off the gas that's heading off the cliff of competitiveness and pressure through their creativity, if they can suddenly go and sit by a stream for a couple of hours and lose themselves in reflections or ripples or the the soundscape of 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 joy, now that that's huge to me. So the, the rise and the growth and the success of expressive photography tell me that there's a need for, for this, yeah. um, which makes me think, well, it's not just me. You know, I, I'd like to think I'm a pretty normal guy with the same fears and aspirations as most. You know, I'd, I'd say I'm reasonably normal. Um, I've had to work really hard to, to achieve the things I've achieved in my life. Uh, and most people do. Very few people have it all land on a plate for them. Um, and the second thing was that I, I, I got this fellowship at the Royal Society last year. Um, and some people who I really admire said some really nice things about my work. And, and, and uh, that was very humbling for me as well, because this work, particularly the Gobi work and the Out of Darkness book that I've been making, mm -hmm. Because I used a portfolio of images for my fellowship that are in the book, to have those recognized for what they are and very different from a traditional mainstream photographic approach. And to have people who I really admire, like Tim Rudman and Joe Cornish, you know, and David Ward, you know, saying positive things about the work, it meant a great deal to me. So the combination of those two things, uh, I, I think there's a definite need for this in the world. I'm not going to ever have the biggest audience in the world. You know, I'm not going to have hundreds of thousands of subscribers on YouTube. Um, I'm, I'm, but you can change the world one person at a time. Sure. You know, 
and and I think it, I don't want the pressure of thinking I want this to be the new way that photography is taught or any of that. I just disagree with a lot of the status quo. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think if the traditional way of teaching photography worked, then everyone wouldn't be <laughs> surfing YouTube looking for the answers. Absolutely. You know, if, if it was if it was there in one book that people just went, this is the best book in photography, read that and it's done. You know, yeah, why, I, don't, why I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that book exists. <laughs> well, yeah, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> just not everyone knows you. <laughs> so talk to me about the uh, fellowship. How did that come about? Was that something um, you applied for, or was it something that was by? Yeah, it, it, it's it's it, it's a kind of a weird one actually, because I back in two thousand and twelve, thirteen, thirteen maybe, I'd applied for for an associate ship with the Royal Society, right. and I didn't get it, um, and. I remember being utterly furious at the time, you know, I just like how good you are. <laughs> who, yeah, yeah. It was just like <laughs> I, I, it, I, I felt mortally offended by that. Um, and now I look back and I understand why. You know, I, I, I totally understand why. Um, and it was just in the summer last year. Um, I'm getting to an age where. I'm 55. Um, I have many years, hopefully, of active work left in me. Yep. But the the body of work that I put together for the Out of Darkness book means a great deal to me. You know, yep. it, it really means a great deal to me. It, it represents an awful lot more than a bunch of pretty photographs in a book. It's my first photo book. Um, my wife has really been pushing me to do this um, because she loves them as mm. well. So I think I was at that point in time where I just thought it, it would be useful to get a very objective outside view on this body of work. So this is before the book was written. You know, it, it, it was a it was a very strong concept, but it hadn't been written. I hadn't sat there. And, oh, wait a minute! I, I, by, by the time I applied, I think I'd written a good chunk of the text. Right. But um, it, it was just one of those things. And yes, you apply. You know that they have a couple of assessment days on an annual basis, and you submit uh, twenty one images and a statement of cont- uh, statement of intent. Yep. Um, and then when the assessment day came along, I watched it on Zoom. Uh, you can't talk or anything like that, but I, I watched it and and obviously w- was thankfully accepted and 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 uh, I can now use these letters after my name and all that type of stuff. But my mum was very proud. Um, Congratulations! My, well, thank you. My my eldest brother is a is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Okay. Um, so yeah, that that's two out of three she's got. Well done. <laughs> well done. I think you know that that recognition by peers. I think is, and in particular, peers that you respect very much, uh, is a very important aspect to you know any creative endeavor. You know, if somebody that you respect tells you, "Hey, that's pretty good. I, I like what you're doing. Keep doing it." You know, you you're going to keep doing it. Yeah, and no, this is a really interesting point because you know making. Not everyone has the same ability to objectively assess how good a photograph is. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's the same with people who, who have an objective skill at listening to a piece of music and recognizing a well-made piece of music or a well-composed or a well-performed piece of music. And I remember listening to a, like a Radio 4, BBC Radio 4 thing once, and it was talking about um, Rachmaninoff and someone was saying, I can't stand Rachmaninoff. You know, I absolutely hate Rachmaninoff. And there was this amazing professor from some incredibly prestigious music school who said, I don't believe you're qualified to make that statement. You know, <laughs> we're basically, you, you know, you, yes, you might not like it, but you're not qualified to say that he's not a good composer. Yeah. Um, and, and I think... And there, you know, there's a difference between opinion and likes and dislikes and 
as you said, you know, definitively proving that something is good or not not so good. well you know and, and in the arts there's there's always going to be a degree of subjectivity in that Absolutely. you know you know it doesn't matter how good you know it's like you could stick a piece of music on it doesn't matter how good it is it doesn't mean i have to like it that's but right that is that is opinion um and i think an awful lot of social media mistakes opinion for fact yeah um, and i've got very little time for that you know and i think this is part of i mean i do mentoring and things like that you know when you're mentoring somebody and they're sending you work you might not like it but you can still recognize its worth yeah and and how important it is for that person because technical flaws like sensor spots or sharpening halos or things like that they're they're they are objectively yeah. up to a point because if the person wants to the image to feel aggressive and angular and yeah. jarring yeah. and so forth, yeah. then that's fine go for it crank up the, the clarity slider if that's your intent and that's part of your expressive uh nature yeah. then who am i to say you're you're not wrong it's just i don't like it that's it yeah, yeah. so you've lived in a number of places around the world have you got a favorite uh that's a really tough one actually and that kind of ebbs and flows um somewhat when we we're in lockdown for nearly two years i was getting a little bit tired of being here mm -hmm. um but most of my life these days i spend within about 10 miles of home um you know, and I, we live in a very beautiful part of the west coast of Scotland. You know, so we're super lucky, surrounded by, you know, the sea and and mountains and forests and so forth. Uh, I do love Scotland very, very much. Um, and to visit is different to live. Um, yeah. Yeah. The the north coast of Spain, I particularly love. Um, my wife and I are going uh, back to Spain in a couple of weeks' time, actually, for five weeks. We're, we're going to head off. We're taking the truck over, and, and we're going to drive around and go to some places we haven't been before. And nice. So north coast of Spain, I really, really love. Um, the world is full of incredible landscapes. I mean, oh, absolutely. You, you guys have got some of the best seascapes in the world. Um, I love Australia. I'd gladly come back to Australia. I've got a ton of friends on both coasts, uh, all, all coasts, in fact. Um, there's a few places I haven't been that I probably, I always said I didn't want to go anywhere else. You know, I, I felt I'd been everywhere I wanted to go, but I haven't been to Patagonia and I think I would like to go. Yep. Bolivia, I'd probably like to go, but I don't know. It, it takes me a lot to get inspired and motivated to do those things. I'm going to be spending some time in the States later this year. I'm, I'm yeah. going to be hanging out with Bill Neal and yep. Alex Noriega and Adam Gibbs. And, you know, I'm going to be spending some time with some friends. So there's going to be a lot of time in the American Southwest and the Northwest Pacific Coast and stuff. And I haven't spent a ton of time in those areas. But, yeah, I mean, I think one of the great things that COVID taught was that there's a lot of beautiful aesthetics in our backyard, you know, close to home, you know, and even if you live in a city, there's parks, there's canals, there's waterways, you know, you're in Sydney, right? I am. Um, I, I spent, I think it was 165 days in lockdown where the furthest I could travel was five kilometres from yeah. the front wall. Uh, yeah. In that radius, there's one park with a dirty stream in it. Other than that, there's soccer fields and suburban houses and, you know, lots of street lights and electric wires hanging off telegraph poles and whatever. Um, that sounds like a project. <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I wasn't particularly inspired, though, <laughs> because I'm, I'm used to standing knee-deep in seawater watching you know, the next wave come in and try to capture that, you know, and so that, that <laughs> kind of kind of anathema to me is sort of sitting in that suburban. And, yeah, as you say, you know, you, I, I quite, you know, possibly could have made a project out of it. Instead, I ended up starting this podcast. So that, All right, that cool. ended up being my, my COVID project was uh, kicking this off and, you know, nice. I'm, 
I, I'm enjoying it so much now. I, I mean, I wasn't sure when it first started how many people would, uh, you know, say yes. And, you know, very honoured to have people like yourself, uh, you know, uh, agree to appear. And, uh, you know, it's, it's it's growing and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the choice that I made. I, I think I'll probably... <laughs> doing better with this than I would have done if I'd been trying to shoot uh, my, my, the suburbs around my my home. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, it's you never know until you try, right? Oh, well, this is it, yeah. yeah. I was, I, as I say, I wasn't particularly inspired to do it, so maybe, maybe I'll give it a shot. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Um, I guess talking about uh, you know places to shoot or you know experiences in shooting, what what's your most memorable? Oh, I think the Gobi. I mean, the Gobi changed everything. I mean that 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 was one of the most defining moments of my life at all. Um, Tibet is amazing, you know being in Tibet and being up high and surrounded by 8,000 meter peaks and just the whole, the whole spiritual resonance of the place is, is really important. Um, I, the older I get, I think, and the more strongly I feel it's not where you are, it's how and who you are. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, having a sense of peace and acceptance inside your own body allows you to find beauty in places that aren't so obviously inspiring. You know, yes, I've been to Iceland and Northern Norway and Finland and, you know, the Arctic and yep. Africa. And, you know, I've, I've been to lots of incredible places that, that people would think, oh yeah, that's an amazing place and so forth. But equally, you know, I, I can literally go up the coast here and find a stretch of coast that I've never been to before and make photographs that are as meaningful to me as Aurora over a pointy peak in Iceland yeah. would be. Um, so I, I think that internal landscape is the one that, I get the most fun exploring is finding things in the landscape that are somehow a resonance with what's going on inside my own head. Mm. Um, so ironically, my, my, my favorite landscape is, is the one that's kind of in here these days, I think. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it, it's because the good thing about that is you carry it around with you all the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, which is why I can have a glass of water on a table and see the light shining through it. And it might inspire me to get my phone out. You know, it, it's, it's not about making something it's, it's that moment of engagement in the thing that's right in front of you is way more important to me these days anyway but yeah I mean, I'm, I'm sure my traveling isn't done yet and stuff but i'm very fortunate I've, I've been some amazing places and i think they always say that you need to travel around the world to make you appreciate where you come from yeah absolutely yeah you know i, I really love the west scotland you know it's like i'm never even on a day like today, I went out for a 10K and it's shitting it down with rain. And I, I did my 10K just getting soaked, but the, the the rain hitting the surface of the sea and, you know, yeah. It's part of the way this coast of Scotland is, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, I've got a solar watch and it was like pointless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to kind of agree with you. I, I really uh, enjoyed my very brief time up uh, up the west coast, um, you know, around uh, Oban and uh, some of the locks further north. No, right. That, uh, that's not far from where we are. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely enjoyed, uh, you know, my, my time there. And, uh, you know, if I ever get back there, I might, might look you up and uh, take you out for a beer. That's always a perfectly okay thing. I, I, I more or less quit drinking last year. Oh, okay. Uh, May, May last year. I, I, I Take out a glass of water then? <laughs> oh, no, no. I'll, have, I'll still have a beer. I said I pretty much stopped. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've, 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 I've discovered moderation, which is a, something that was a bit alien to me when I was you younger. Can't, you can't take beer out of the Scotsman. <laughs> can't take whiskey out of a Scotsman. <laughs> That's the, the, that was always my weakness. Uh, fair enough. 
So how important do you think it is to have projects uh, as part of your portfolio? You know, I mean, people can make a project of their entire body of work and their entire portfolio, you know, end to end. But then, you know, you've got, as you said, your um, Out of Darkness project, for example. You know, how important do you think that is to helping people with developing their technique and developing their creativity? I'm kind of... The Out of Darkness project came much later than the photographs came. So I'm, I made the photographs without thinking about it as a project. Right. Um, whereas there are people who are friends of mine who are very project driven. It's like their entire life is about projects and yep. they're super focused and they, they have a concept in mind and they go out and they shoot for a concept. Yep. And that, that's a fairly um, acceptable way or accepted way of pursuing projects is to come up with a concept or to make a photograph and think, oh, that would make a good concept and use that as the foundation stone. Um, I think the, the danger the danger with questions like this, and, and this isn't a criticism of the question, it's just the danger of questions like this, is that people look on them as definitive answers to growth. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, if I do a project, it, it will help me with my growth. Um, whereas the opposite is equally true. You do a project and it could ruin photography for you. Yeah. Because yeah. the pressure, the disappointment, the expectation, the driving five, five you know, hours you know, in the exactly morning. what you were looking for and you, you throw the whole thing out. Yeah, it, it, it can become, you know... The, the definition of a project is a concept. And if you go out looking for that concept and you don't find something that fits in with the concept, the argument could be, well, you've had a shitty day. You're judging the day based on your lack of um, success in finding what you hope to find. And I think that is a negative. Uh, I'm all about positives. You know, I want, I want my life to be a positive thing. I want it to be I'm not pursuing joyfulness, but I'm certainly, and neither am I running away from suffering. It, it's just, I'm a very accepting kind of guy. Yeah. So if I go out and make a certain type of photograph that I like, then that's good for me. You know, I, so I'm, I'm not particularly project driven. In fact, I'm not project driven basically. Mm. Um, I think if, well, mainly because I'm having to spend most of my time making content, you know, I'm, I'm making two videos a week, you know, one for the main YouTube channel, one for the, for the forum. Um, I'm writing more eBooks. I'm finishing out of darkness. I spend a lot of time on Twitter spaces with other sides of my work. Um, I do mentoring, you know, I've, I'm, I'm busy, you know, even sitting down at my music, and spending a couple of hours on that, sometimes I feel guilty for doing that because I could be doing something else. Yeah. So adding the pressure of doing another project or I, I do, the thought has crossed my mind, you know, after Out of Darkness, what, what would I follow Out of Darkness with if I wanted to do another project? And I thought to myself, What's, what a stupid question. It will arrive or it may not, you know, at some point in the future, if I come up with something else that means so much to me that I want to put it into a project, then it will work. Well, in terms, I did, have, did have a question about what what was next for Alice there, but uh, I won't ask that now. <laughs> uh, well, you know, but I'd, I'd give you an answer. Um, the but the the second part of your question was: Can working on a project help you with your development and your growth? Mm. Um, possibly, possibly. I mean. Some people are incredibly self-disciplined. Some people are less so. Uh, some people are very technically adept. Some people are less so. Uh, some people are um, very likely to go into flow states. Other people are less likely to go into flow states. Yep. I think the danger with having a vision of what you would like to become can be a distraction from you becoming who you are. 
Sure. Um, and I think there's a my it, it's probably becoming clear to you these days, or after the, the time we've spent talking already, that I'm less interested in in having a vision of what I want to become in a creative sense. Yep. I have a target for what I want my body fat percentage to be. <laughs> You know, but but that's something that's science. You know, it, that's just to do with calories in, calories out, and a certain amount of exercise. And you know, that that's achievable just through hitting the right numbers. Yeah, yeah. Who I am as a creative person is not a constant. Who I am as a creative individual is on a spectrum. You know, and and I don't want to think it's the same thing goes with personal style. The concept of personal style, to me is a barrier to creativity because you become stuck in a in a little very narrow band of well this is an acceptable place for me to exist as a creative person otherwise people won't know it's my photograph or people yeah. won't know you know this is an alistair ben or whatever and i i don't give a shit about personal style because if it means something to me right now and i decide to put it on the internet or in a book or in any other way it's because I like it, you know, it's because it means something to me. And if, it doesn't matter if it's totally opposite from something I've done before. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, projects can be. And if I, I think the best projects are the ones that I think the best photographs generally are the ones that ask you to take them. I think the best projects are the ones that evolve and that you get to the point where you just think, okay, I have to do this now because it has to be done. Yep. Um, I, I think anything that's contrived, I could sit down and write a piece of music any day of the week. And the best stuff I write is just spontaneous. It's just, I'm sitting noodling. It's just like, shit, I like that. And then you, you hit record and you start. And yeah. that's where my best music comes from. Yeah, right. So I, I love spontaneity and, and freedom and lack of boundaries. And uh, the, the way I always describe it is I want to be a boat in the middle of the ocean with 360 degrees. Yeah. I want to be able to go anywhere. I don't want to just be in the, a canal and thinking, well, there you go. That's the next 20 yeah. years of your life. Just keep going straight. Yeah. That, that, that to me is a kind of a definition of hell, really. Yeah, got it. <laughs> So what advice would you give a 14-year-old Alice then? Jesus. Not that he'd listen, I guess, but yeah, being 14. Put down your binoculars and spend more time with girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's funny because I have been a huge Rush fan my entire life. Okay. The, the, Canadian, the Canadian rock band Rush. Were, and, and when I was 14 they were the most important thing in my life was right. listening to Rush, the, the ly lyrically and musically. Um, and that and spending time outside, like rock climbing or bird watching or climbing hills or whatever. I was, I was an outdoor kid, mostly. Sure. Um, I think the most important life lesson I have learned that I would always impart to a younger version of myself was the importance of being yourself. You know, un understanding that yes, there's a society out there that you somehow have to fit in, yeah. but not to compromise who you are for the sake of fitting in. Um, so uh, the, the importance of self-actualization, yeah. um, I think is, insanely important self-actualization is probably the most important thing that has changed in my life in the last decade and, and mostly in the last five years just that feeling of self-worth being okay with who i am mm -hmm. enjoying my work not changing the fundamentals of who i am to fit in either with a peer group or a work or a club or or a society you know, and a certain amount of that requires me running my own company. So I'm not working with other people other than my wife. Um, living in a remote area, I'm not a massively sociable person. I'm, I'm a classic introvert. I'm happier in here. 
mm-hmm. uh, than I would be. And that doesn't mean I can't go and stand in front of 500 people giving a talk or whatever, but that's, that's work. That's a performance. Yep. Uh, yep. So, yeah, I think, I think if the 14 year old would listen, it would be, listen, do what you want to do follow your own goals and dreams uh, an awful lot of the decisions I made in my life were doing things that were expected of me sure. uh, rather than I think when my dad died when I was 18 I, I, I had a bit of a wake-up call and realized that life can be short yeah. um, so that was I think I thought very deeply about the quality of life from quite a young age, probably more so than my friends at the time who were just yeah. into drinking and copping off with, with girls and stuff like that. So whereas I was just less into that, it was more quiet time and being alone was more important to me. Yeah. But yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. The, the reason I brought up Rush was that the drummer uh, who used to write the lyrics, um, one of his quotes from one of his books was always be true to the 15 to your 15 year old self Mm. you know that that person that kid who who dared to dream the kid with all the ambition and the goals and the drive and and you know what would your what would your 14 15 year old self think of you now so flipping your question what would my 14 year old self think of me you know, and I, I guess I see a little bit of that with my son. My, my son's 27. Sure, sure. He, and he can he kind of likes me. Yeah. So, so I think that's a good indication. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good place to be. <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd like to think that the values that I have would be admired by my 14-year-old self. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. That's a, that's a, a brilliant answer. If you weren't a photographer, what would you be? Uh, my first, the first thing that came to my head was a drug addict. Um, <laughs> um, I do a lot of stuff that's, I mean, I, I, funnily enough, in answer to your question, I don't really think of myself as a photographer. Okay. Um, you know, I, we just had a census here um, and I had to define myself. I had to write down what my, my what my job was. Yeah. And I said, I called myself an artist. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't think of myself as a landscape photographer, really. Um, so I, I think more of myself as a kind of, there's, there's so much more, personal development and life coach creativity catalyst, I think is what my LinkedIn says. <laughs> um, you know, because, you know, I was in a stupid mood that day. And I, but I was going to say, that, who, came, who came up with that? <laughs> <So>. I did <laughs> because I'm an idiot. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'd like to think that I'm someone who helps other people to, to tap into their own creativity. Yeah. Landscape photography for me is the same. It, it's a tool. It's a yeah. catalyst. It's not the focus. When I'm in the landscape, I'm not there to make photographs. I'm not there as a landscape photographer. I'm there as Alistair Ben, who may or may not get inspired to take my camera out of the bag. Yep. And it's very liberating because I don't go with it, with goals or aspirations or expectations of what the day is going to do. And the people who come on our trips these days, which tend to be very small because I don't want big groups of people, the people who tend to come in the workshops are people who really bought into that. Yeah. And it was like, I was away three times this year, January, February, and March. And on every single time I was away, the people I was with say, don't point out anything. <laughs> yeah. It's like, don't say that's cool or that's cool because they wanted ownership of their engagement with the landscape. Yeah. They wanted to find their stuff. Yeah. They didn't, it was like, and I just leave them to it, no, you know. Right. And then we talk about it, you know. Of course, you talk about it. But if if I wasn't, I mean, I'm. If I'm not, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't think of myself as a landscape photographer. I I wouldn't like aspire to be a musician or a full time writer or anything like that. I, I I think I'm doing pretty much what I want to do. No, um. Cool. So, I and I don't really think I'm going to retire. 
from wanting to do the key stuff that I want to do, which yep. is, you know, like your what's next for Alistair Ben type of thing. I think after the book finishing, I want to spend more time. Um, I just want to spend more time being me and being happy with being me. You know, that that's probably all I really want to do. I, I, I don't, I think I'm very spontaneous. I'm super, super spontaneous. You know, like, you know, and my wife, it's like, you know, we're taking the truck to Spain, you know, and it's, it's that type of stuff. You know, we just, everything's really spontaneous. So I, I think, what I don't want to do is pin myself down to 20 odd weeks of workshops every year. I want to have a bit more fluid time. So smaller workshops, more like retreat style, a bit more like minor white was doing, yeah. um, you know, where people are there to be them, you know, rather than point your camera here and shoot at F11 for two seconds at, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's a few kind of other projects uh, on the go that, I'm not really talking about that are kind of going on under the surface um, that may prove to be very exciting things to do, but they're mostly along the direction of personal development and understanding how creativity can help us be happier with who we are really, and to be better living in our own skin. So that, that's my main drive these days. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there any, uh, actually, I'll, I'll ask that a different way. Who, who should I be talking to on the podcast? Yikes, goodness me. Um, there's so many people who uh, I think are amazing photographers and there are some amazing thinkers. Um I'm really thinking, I'm thinking of the people who I've had uh, on, because I did this vision and light interviewing on, on my YouTube channel, and I've had quite a few people on, on there. Um, Jennifer Renwick okay. is an incredible woman, just absolutely incredible, woman. stunning photographer, deep thinker. Um, if if you if you want me to hook you up with Jen, uh, I, I'll drop her an email for you. I I talk, I talk to Jennifer any day of the week, um, and this isn't you know the, the problem with this is that if I don't mention somebody, it's like well, why not me? Um, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't worry too much about that. <laughs> um, so Jennifer for sure. Um, is an amazing, an amazing photographer. I love Jennifer's work. Um, who else would be a really cool person for you to talk to? I mean, there's so many, really. I mean, you could, you could, you could stick a pin anywhere on the map, and you're going to find somebody. Yeah. Uh, good mate of mine is Adam Gibbs. Adam Gibbs has has yep. got a lovely attitude towards photography, and and has a very deep and personal relationship with the landscape. Um, um yeah we'll talk about this off yeah off no mic. That's, that, that's fine i've got one last and for many who listen to me the the most important question that i can ask uh do you like pineapple on pizza <laughs> uh yes i do excellent <laughs> <laughs> yes i do um as a young man a hawaiian was hard to beat but yeah yeah so yes i i, I do <laughs> i know it's a divide it's like a, it's like a bet you might question though yeah absolutely uh, there's, there's there's two brands of uh chocolate over here it's like a honeycomb uh covered with a milk chocolate one's violent crumble or crunchy and the, there's a big divide here about who who likes those two as well all right but uh, the the I think the the pineapple on pizza is a universal dividing line. You know, there's oh totally, absolutely, absolutely. There's, there's people who head against it, and those that yeah, are right into it. And there's a few. No, I, I, I like cooked pineapple. I think it's a really nice thing. Mm, good. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you very very much for uh, taking the time out to talk to me, Alistair. Um, it's been really fantastic learning much more than uh, I thought I was going to learn about uh, <laughs> you, you and your work. Uh, where can people find what you do? 
Uh, the main website is expressive.photography. So it's not .com, it's expressive.photography. That's my main website. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter, uh, uh, sorry, Insta, it's like at Alistair Ben uh, or at Alistair underscore Ben. I can't remember. Alistair underscore Ben, I think it might be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can send you all these um, these links. Um, so yeah, expressive.photography is the best place. And then the YouTube channel is Express Photography. All right. Thanks again, Alistair. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.